Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, November 24th, 2021, and happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. And of course, speaking of thank you, this is the time that we're supposed to be thinking about gratitude, to be thankful for the good things in life. And there are many all around us, but sometimes, since we're human and we have <laughs> so many weaknesses and flaws, when you're surrounded by crazies and you live under the largest government, the largest empire in the history of the planet, it can be a little challenging. So on this episode, I've got 10 quotes from leading founders and old revolutionaries that, for me, provide a little perspective. A little perspective, maybe even a little motivation to stay the course. Plus one more at the end from Benjamin Franklin that's just perfect for Thanksgiving. First of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, except this Friday. I'm taking the day off at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow the show, all the archives for close to three and a half years now, uh, on individual episodes like this one, I'm going to link to all the original source documents that I'm going to mention, all the quotes, so you can read them in context, reference them, link to them, share them at your convenience, learn more on your own time. Of course, we have all the different platforms. One, we live stream on mainstream ones, of course, YouTube and Facebook and uh, Twitter and Twitch. We live stream at DLive. We live stream at odyssey.com, decentralized and censorship resistant. Check out odyssey.com and please follow us there. We also archive the the video version of the show all over the place. Gab TV, Rumble, Ben Swan's Sovereign.media, Brighteon, BitChute, BitTube, Hyper, Minds, sometimes MeWe. They have some file size limitations that kind of, I don't know, I've asked them about it. I never get a response. And then we have the audio only podcast edition, uh, Apple Podcasts, Podbean, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, all over the place. And even our membership program, where you can find our, you put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. Find all that and more on the show homepage, 10th Amendment Center.com slash path to liberty. And while we're allowing people another moment or so to get notifications to join us in the live stream, a big thank you again. I'm so grateful for you spending some time with me today. Hello to everyone in the live chat. There's Richard Banks in Fredonia, Kansas, Cheriton Farmer in Missouri, Tim Martin. Good to see you, buddy, in Arizona. I always appreciate your emails and your feedback. Dixie Strong in Alabama, Clay Kent, Jennifer Coop. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well. Joyce Code. I got to make sure I get that name right. That's hello from Arkansas. A renegade robot in Bama. Haji 54. Good to see you, buddy. Joe Vasquez. Dave Simmons here in SoCal. We're almost neighbors. I'm in Los Angeles, so I guess we're relatively close. Good to see you. Jemima Apo. Patricia Dance in Syracuse. Sharon Patriot and everyone else. Thank you so much for spending time with me. I can't say that enough. I mean, literally just sharing and liking and reviews, all that stuff has been helping me do something. I've been running the show for over three years. When I started, I'm like, man, I've got some video gear because I've shot some stuff and I really enjoy this kind of thing. It gives me an outlet to do some creative things, at least on the technology end of things. And if it wasn't for your interest and people sharing it and telling other people and spreading the word, uh, it wouldn't have expanded as we've expanded. We're not huge by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm so grateful for your support and spending time. Uh, Nic- Nikolai Bjorin in Florida as well saying hello in the chat. But let's get right to this. And I want to start out and I want to start out with Thomas Paine. And this one is written in The Crisis, the first one that was published December 23rd, 1776, just before Christmas. And if you think about the timing of this, the uh, Revolutionary War. Now, we know the Revolution, as John Adams put it so many times, for example, to a letter in a letter to Hezekiah Niles, the Revolution was before the war commenced. The Revolution itself was a change in the minds and the hearts, the political and religious sentiments of the people. It began all the way back. The beginning of the controversy was really in 1761. James Otis Jr.'s arguments against the writs of assistance where he was referring to a big, a monumental shift in American political thought about sovereignty, who held final authority. And he said, an act against the Constitution is void, which would have been absurd at the time Because government was sovereign, and if government said that they weren't violating government's rules, written or unwritten, we know it was the unwritten constitution at the time, then it doesn't matter what anyone else has to say. There is, but Otis was saying, there is something, a higher power, a higher authority that actually 
government couldn't violate these rules. But that's a quick side note. But at the time that Thomas Paine was writing The Crisis in December 1776, the actual war, the physical conflict had been absolutely raging and things weren't looking too awesome. And he was saying to the people like, look, they're going to start throwing. In fact, we're starting to hear rumblings of some kind of reconciliation. They're going to give us some of the things that we want. But we can't trust these people. A government with so much power, and in fact, it claims the power over us in all cases whatsoever. It may seem difficult. The odds are stacked against us, but we can't give in. We have to keep pushing on. And he said specifically, though the flame of liberty may sometimes cease to shine, the coal can never expire. So liberty in the long run, Thomas Paine recognized, and I agree with him, liberty wins in the end, whether it uh, takes a lot of short-term or long-term losses because people don't love it, they don't respect it, they don't value it, they don't know how to defend it. It's still there. We just have to keep stoking that those flames of liberty and pushing forward, whether it's a David versus Goliath situation, we're again facing the largest government in the history of the world. It certainly is in many ways. But we have to keep pushing on. It is incumbent upon us. It's our duty to take a stand to push forward for the Constitution and liberty, no matter how difficult it may seem. So thank you to Thomas Paine, December 23rd, 1776. The next comes from John Dickinson, the penman of the revolution. In fact, we have this phrase. It's a Latin phrase, and I've been getting some help from a very kind person in the, in the chat, in the archives. And how to say this, who is a expert in Latin to some degree, way more than I am. I'm terrible. But the Latin phrase, we have it. It's our motto on our membership card. Concordia res parve crescunt. Crescunt, I think is how you say it. It means small things grow great by concord. And this is from his first letter from a farmer in Pennsylvania in 1767. And he was arguing against the hated uh, Townsend Acts of that year. This was the first letter was published. He had he had them all written in advance, but he published them in a series. The first one was no November 5th, 1767. And this is how he signed off the end of that first letter, setting the stage. Like, look, we may not be able to stop these Townsend Acts, these the New York Restraining Act, but if we ignore what's going on in this other colony, if we ignore in our in our call, if we ignore here in Pennsylvania what's happening in New York or in Virginia or elsewhere and we do nothing, it's eventually going to hit us. And even though we may not be able to stop it dead in its tracks today, we have to do something. We have to take a tiny step forward. And he was calling for literally non-binding resolutions in support in, or in opposition of the Townsend Acts in support of liberty and support of the people in the colonies. And he said this small step can lead to others because small things grow great by concord. When more and more people get on board, they rally to the cause. You can build on that. And obviously the penman of the revolution was right because small things certainly did grow great by concord. Thomas Jefferson had the same type of approach when it came to strategy in his letter, which I cite all the time. Those of you who listen to me or read our work, you know this stuff is always going to be out there. His letter to his friend, the Reverend Charles Clay, January 10, 27th, 1790. He said, the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. We often hear from people today like, okay, this here we're facing this, 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 this. And if you don't stop it all in one fell swoop, which is just an absurd... <sighs> It's an absurd thing. Of course, we want to have the ultimate goal, but none of this stuff, anyone who ever actually does the work to advance liberty knows that you never get it all done in one fell swoop. You're not, there is no silver bullet to defeating the largest government in the history of the world. When the, the founders, when the old revolutionary is saying, push on, there's a flame of liberty. There's just a tiny flame. Small things grow great by concord. The ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. We have to continually push forward no matter how much the odds are against us. This is the consistent message here for Thanksgiving, I guess. He says the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches, that we must be contented to secure what we can get from time to time and eternally press forward for what is yet to get. Our opposition are sometimes our opposition, those who hate the Constitution and liberty, those who pretend to love them but don't actually follow them. These are all our opposition. They're all around us constantly, every single day. And sometimes they're with us on small steps, but they say that's the end of the story. Like some people who want to uh, help us in our, or we want to help, 
However, that may work. We work in a coalition to stop warrantless mass surveillance. Well, they may only stop at part of the level on certain issues in certain situations. Well, that's a small step. But if we side with them and we say, oh, everything's done here, that's exactly what our opposition wants. That's what the tyrants want. And I'll get to another one, a quote from that. Uh, on that from Samuel Adams as well. So Jefferson saying the ground of liberty is to be gained by inches. He continues, he says, it takes time to persuade men to do even what is for their own good. We get stuck in habits. We get stuck in things being easy. And when things are difficult, going from despotism to liberty, Jefferson wrote sometime later, going from despotism to liberty isn't going to happen in a feather bed. Taking a stand for what's right, doing what's morally good, what's just against the largest government in the history of the world isn't going to be easy. And it takes risk. It takes people willing to stick their neck out. Not every single day, not all the time, not making everything a hill to die on. But certainly we have to be strategic about that. And that's what Thomas Jefferson was saying here. We have to take the small wins, continually push forward, eternally press forward for what is yet to get. I want to read that one more time. The ground of liberty is to be gained by inches, that we must be contented to secure what we can get from time to time and eternally press forward for what is yet to get, because it takes time to persuade men to do even what is for their own good. And that's very similar to, I think, the, the mentality that Abigail Adams had writing to her son, John Quincy, who was only 12 at the time. This is in March of 1780. She said, learning is not attained by chance. It must be sought for with ardor and attended to with diligence. And we have opportunities to educate all around us. I've learned so much more truth outside of the government school system. I learned nothing in the government school system. In fact, I had to take so many steps back to unlearn it, but the opportunities, we have it available. And there are more and more people. You're here with me today. That's more than when I started years ago, I'll tell you that. There are people out there who are attending to learning and trying to unlearn what the propaganda indoctrination centers have shoved down our throats. But as John Jay has pointed out in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, this is October 27, 1786. Let's be realistic here. He said, the knaves and fools of this world are forever in alliance. Those people who are willingly or accidentally being fools, ignorant, intentionally ignorant. It takes a lot of work sometimes to be ignorant, to avoid all uh, different viewpoints, to only just get stuck in your corner and then dig in. Uh, is something good or bad based on which team is in power? This is a horrible mentality. And the knaves, the evil people of the world, love playing along with this. And that's John Jay to Thomas Jefferson. It gives me a little perspective when I see people saying the dumbest things and then flipping it around. When in 2016, suddenly a lot of my kind of uh, very progressive friends who were somewhat familiar with my work here at 10th Amendment Center, but would laugh it off locally here when I would hang out with them. Ah, yeah, whatever, dumb, who cares? As soon as 2016 hit, I start getting phone calls and messages. Hey, dude, uh, you know all that stuff you've been talking about? Now I'm interested. And to me, it's, you know, this is a good reminder here that those people are always going to exist. They always have. This is nothing new. And we still have to push forward Anyway, now just because people have blindly sat by and even good people have said this is too overwhelming, just because we've allowed this, we the people will say, have allowed this largest government and many in many cases have begged for it doesn't mean that the people can't change their mind at some point. It's not it's not that, oh, OK, well, you've allowed this to happen for decades and decades, if not since 1791, really, uh, and much worse since the 1860s, 1913, the New Deal era. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And just because the people have allowed this doesn't mean it has to be like that permanently. St. George Tucker, in his great view of the Constitution of the United States in 1803, put it this way. The acquiescence of the people of a state under any usurped authority for any length of time can never deprive them of the right of resuming the sovereign power into their own hands whenever they think fit or are able to do so since that right is perfectly unalienable. And I was always talking, I wasn't even thinking of bringing up James Otis and his discussion about acts against the Constitution being void and this representing a shift in American political thought regarding sovereignty, final authority, because if government 
did something and government held that sovereignty, government could make the decision whether government violated government's rules. So if the people are sovereign, as St. George Tucker here is talking about, then even if the people have basically submitted, quietly, passively submitted, had non, had all kinds of compliance and non-resistance to arbitrary usurped authority, powers exercise that were never authorized or delegated to them in the Constitution, just because they have for any length of time, it could be one day or a thousand years, just because they've given in on that for a long time doesn't mean because the people ultimately hold sovereignty and should the people exercise that power, that right, that inherent right, un perfectly unalienable right, they can resume that final authority whenever they want, any single time they want. And here from Samuel Adams, of course, we have to learn about that. And this is a big part of our work here. Samuel Adams, in his great uh, essay as Candidus in the Boston Gazette, this was the publication organ, we can call it, of the Sons of Liberty, October 14th, 1771. The father of the American Revolution put it this way, the truth is all might be free if they valued freedom and defended it as they ought. And that's really the one-two punch. And that, to me, often gives me hope. I think about this, the whole essay from Samuel Adams. Of course, I will link to it in the show notes at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It is packed full of awesomeness. This is one of the best ones ever, I think. And to me, it's a reminder that there is, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I am very cynical in the short term, and I'm very positive in the long term. I believe that markets are more powerful than government. I believe that the people have intelligence naturally. Whether they choose to not use it, they choose to not do the learning that Abigail Adams was talking about or not in the time being. I think in the long run, people can learn. Markets are more powerful than government, and liberty in itself will defeat, will win in the end. I just don't have a lot of hope for a lot of it in the short term. I think things can get far worse, but we have to, as Samuel Adams talked about defending the li liberty and the Constitution against all hazards as being a moral duty. So I hold to that as well, but I also, it's nice to have an understanding that at the end of the line, there's something positive. If we can educate people about the values of freedom and how to defend it, then everyone can be free. And I'm so grateful for that uh, amazing line from Samuel Adams in October of 1771. And that's really what drives a lot of our work every single day here at the 10th Amendment Center. I've got, got up here on the screen our annual State of the Nullification Movement report. I've been talking about this, saying we're close to getting it done. We're close to getting it done. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash report. This is the most important document that we publish every year. It is a full free download. This is up to date as of this moment through 2019 and 2020. The first half of the book, you don't have to subscribe, you don't have to give your name, nothing. Just click a link, download and read. You can get a PDF uh, or a uh, an ebook version for Apple and elsewhere. The first half of the book talks about the, the strategies that we use, the strategies of the founders, how they use those strategies to defeat federal programs without relying on the federal government to limit its own power, how it was used throughout history. And then the second half is how it's being used today. We just finished it. It is totally done for 2021. I will have this link updated sometime over the weekend, if not on Monday, but it is complete. I've got a couple of print copies in hand. It looks fantastic. Uh, thanks to some amazing work by a lot of people behind the way, uh, behind the scenes. And there's absolutely no way that we can get this kind of work done. The education, the historical research, plus the activism. We have to do this one-two punch that Samuel Adams is talking about. Not only can we just teach people about how things are supposed to be, a lot of people focus on that. This is how things should be, or this is how things shouldn't be, but they don't follow through with the, how do you get from point A to point B? So we really work on this one-two punch here at the TAC. It really drives all the things that we do every single day. And there's absolutely nothing that helps us roll up our sleeves every day and build that foundation brick by brick, person by person, for the Constitution and Liberty every single day of the year than the financial faith and support of our members. And with that, I want to say a quick thank you to just a handful of people who have joined us as members lately. I saw a number of people out in the live chat who are also either short or long-term members, and I'm so grateful for your support. There's Diera in Kentucky, Bobby in California, Sandra in Oregon, Charles in Illinois, Spencer in Vermont, Brian in Wyoming, Dan in Pennsylvania, 
and Jennifer in Utah, thank you so much for supporting our work. Uh, we couldn't do this without your help. So we're going to be updating that uh, annual State of the Nullification Movement Report in the next couple of days online. Uh, and I'm... I think it's really amazing stuff. It's 148 pages this time around, so the the first half is pretty pretty incredible. Er, it's the best version that we've done. Anyways, we can't just sit on our laurels. We can't rest on our laurels and say we've done some things because we still live under the largest government in history. And even though we're making headway, we're seeing nullification efforts more than at any time in history. Back to Samuel Adams again as Candidus in the Boston Gazette, same essay, October 14th, 1771. He reminds me, and I hope he reminds you, that even with a small victory, if we're gaining liberty by inches, we never have, we can never just give up until we get to the end, to the end goal. And the end goal is actual freedom, not just permission slips, because it's not really liberty if it's permission slip, not just getting away with stuff, not being lucky that government isn't cracking down, but in a situation where if government even tried to get out of line, it would be resisted and opposed at every single level. That is a state of freedom according to the founding generation. And here's how Samuel Adams put it. He said, instead of sitting down satisfied with the efforts we have already made, which is the wish of our enemies, the necessity of the times more than ever, calls for our utmost circumspection, deliberation, fortitude, and perseverance. So no matter how many times we get a win on the board, and we're getting more and more small victories on a state, local, and we see individual levels, over and over every single year, it's building. It's building more and more, and we can continue to see that. We can't just say, oh, yeah, good job, pat on the back, let's just be good. We're not satisfied with the efforts we've already made. We know that our enemies want us to stop. We, they want us to stop while they have power, while they can actually reverse things. They'll take a loss here and there because the overall big picture is that they keep marching forward. And so as soon as we give up thinking that we've gotten the job done, we've actually just handed them the entire system. So thank you again to Samuel Adams for that one. And of course, John Hancock with the reminder and put it a very Hancockian, I guess, in his Massacre Day oration, March 5th, 1774 in Boston, they did an annual oration, an annual event, a, a remembrance, a very solemn celebration, I guess, a reminder of what happened in Boston the massacre that we could call it. So they called it Massacre Day Oration. And John Hancock, I think this was the fourth year, the third or fourth year, number three, that they did a speech. Uh, Joseph Warren did a few, and I'll get to him in a moment. But here's how Hancock put it, put it. I glory in publicly avowing my eternal enmity to tyranny. So we can't just be quiet about this stuff. And some people, that's all we can do is just talk about it. Some of us can lead by example and show people how to be more free, but we can't keep it quiet. In politics, John Adams once put it, the middle way is none at all. If we're just being silent, we're not opposing the stuff that government is doing in our own way to as many people as possible. We have to be smart about it. We don't want to be jerks. We want to convince people, but we have to actually lead by example. And John Hancock gloried in the idea of putting his neck out, being the public face in his opposition, his enmity to tyranny. And one more Massacre Day oration is our last quote, motivational quote, I think. Uh, this is one of my favorites from the great Joseph Warren, the great patriot, in his Massacre Day oration, uh, March 5th, 1772. And here's the end goal. Of course, we have to think about the long-term goal. If we're taking small steps towards liberty, what is the end goal? And to Joseph Warren, this is what it was. And I agree. May our land be a land of liberty, the seat of virtue, the asylum of the oppressed, a name and pray, a name and a praise in the whole earth, until the last shock of time shall bury the empires of the world in one common, undistinguished ruin. Man, I love that one. So we want to be a land of liberty, an asylum for the oppressed. That was the goal, the seed of virtue. The good people come to America, not the other way around, and bury the empires of the world in one common undistinguished world ruin. Thank you to all the great patriots. Thank you to Joseph Warren. Thank you for watching or listening. And let's wrap it up with this one fun quote. It's from Benjamin Franklin. You'll see this cited all over the places. It's in a letter. And I put letter in scare quotes or air quotes to Sarah Bash. 
he never sent it. It's real. I'll link to the uh, original source document so you can read it. And there's an interesting history that goes along with it at Library of Congress. Uh, no, maybe at archives.gov, actually. And it's this is a paraphrase, but here's how he put it. I wish the bald eagle had not been chosen as the representative of our country. He is a bird of bad moral character, like those among men who live by sharping and robbing. He is generally poor and often very lousy. The turkey is a much more respectable bird. That's some great Benjamin Franklin to wrap it up. And with that, I want to say one more time, happy Thanksgiving. I hope you have a very happy, healthy, and safe and wonderful, whatever you may be doing, whether you're by yourself or with a bunch of people, friends, family, whatever. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving uh, tomorrow and the whole weekend. I hope every day is pretty awesome for you. And I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. Uh, I want to take a quick look over in the chat and see if there's any comments I can reply to. Tim Martin says, nice to see the Tenther family growing. Absolutely. Uh, Joyce Code says, these streams are always good. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Patricia Dance says, that quote of Hancock was the introduction to the TV series Counter-Strike in the 90s. I had no idea. That's really cool. I'm going to have to look that up. Philly South says, the cure for 84 is 1776. I actually think it's 1798 or 1765, the opposition, the nullification of the Stamp Act or nullification of the Alien and Sedition Acts. But uh, same concept, really, I guess. Different version, I think. I think 1776, if we're talking about the revel the war being an outcome of the real revolution, the real American revolution being a change in the thoughts and views and political viewpoints of the people, that's really what we need. We need a revolution in thought. We need people who value freedom and defend it, know how to defend it, and then go out and defend it as they ought. American Free Press says, awesome video, great work. Ravioli Squirrel says, uh, path to liberty, you know what we got to... There's a really long quote. <laughs> Looks like someone's writing articles. Hopefully they're publishing it on a blog. Patricia Dance, great quote from Payne. I want to go back to that one more time because I think this is the one that we need to be reminded of every single day. Especially, I mean, it is so hard to give up. It's so easy to give up hope. It's so hard to stay focused. For me, I'm lucky that I um, always think really long term, really big picture. Uh, my time preference does not actually drive me to need short term results all the time. I see everything as a tiny step, whether I reach one person or 1000. When I started the organization as a blog, I really was hope to reach one or two people. That was my goal. And so every time I've reached more than that, whether it's thousands or hundreds of thousands, and in many cases, millions, if you count it up over the years uh, since 2006, there's always more because we're still having to take a stand for liberty. Let's read Thomas Paine one more time before we wrap it up. Though the flame of liberty may sometimes cease to shine, the coal can never expire. Again, I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. I hope you have an amazing Thanksgiving week. Uh, if you support the show, you want to help us out, of course, our membership program, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month. We make that go a long, long way in support of the Constitution and liberty. And whether you can or you can't help out financially, no obligation on that. But if you're able to, I'm very grateful for any consideration you can give to joining us. Of course, the free and easy things that you can do as well is leave a review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform, smashing the like button on all the video platforms, leaving comments in the archive, helping trigger that algorithm and telling those mainstream platforms to show the program to more people helps us reach as many as possible until they kick us off. Anyways, thank you for being here. I hope you have an amazing Thanksgiving, and I will see you next week, Monday, here on the Path to Liberty.